Dean of the Emeritus College here at Arizona State University, and with me on my right is the founding Dean of the College, uh, Professor Dick Jacob, and on my left is the Associate Dean of the College, Professor Chuck Elliott, and uh, on my left next to Chuck is a founding member of the College and the editor of our newsletter, uh, and that's Professor Winifred Doan. And, uh, the Emeritus College is part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Arizona State University becoming a comprehensive research university. And we represent a variety of disciplines. Uh, Professor Jacob is a physicist, and uh, Professor uh, Elliott is an industrial engineer, and Professor Doan is a biology uh, professor, and I'm a sociology professor. And that would be representative of the 366 members of the college. Now, this is the 50th anniversary of Arizona State University becoming a comprehensive research university. We were formed in, uh, in uh, 18, it was uh, 87, I believe. And, but it wasn't until 50 years ago that we really became a comprehensive research university like many of our peers in the Pac-10 like uh, UCLA and Washington or in the Big Ten like uh, Indiana or Michigan. And that beginning is part of the membership of our college and we have a lot of reminiscences as to how and when we came and then formed the Emeritus College a number of years ago. But when we came, each of us, and we'll uh, uh, discuss our different experiences, but we were part of the recruitment of faculty, research faculty around the country to develop what eventually became, by the early 1990s, uh, Research One University. That's uh, one of the leading research universities in the, in the country. There are 84 of them. And uh, the oldest ones, of course, would be Harvard and Princeton and Yale, and then uh, you've got great public universities like uh, Michigan and Berkeley and, uh, and Chapel Hill. Well, we're part of that. And what was happening when we came, in my case, I came in 1967 out of Michigan and uh, uh, both the University of Michigan and Wayne State University, and I was, along with others, part of the recruitment of faculty to help establish the doctoral programs. Uh, probably over 90% of the doctoral programs at ASU were established between 1965 and 1975. So it was a very exciting period. And we were growing rapidly. As you well know, we're still growing uh, rapidly. I think we're the largest university in the country now. And it was a time when those of us who were recruited were from all over the country and left our family of, and our communities of origin so everybody was oriented to connecting as colleagues and friends, and some of my, uh, my uh, oldest friends, 35, 40 years or more, uh, were formed because people were open to uh, the kind of friendship and working relationships that weren't quite as common in the more established uh, universities. It was a very exciting period. And that cohort of faculty are beginning to retire, but they haven't retired from their academic interests. That is, uh, many of us were still teaching, lecturing, being on dissertation uh, at master's thesis committees, working with undergraduates, and so led by uh, Dick Jacob, uh, a number of us began to say, you know, there are several other emeritus colleges in the country that take active faculty who have gone on to emeritus retired status and want to be reactivated or continue being activated. And so a number of years ago, about four years ago, I believe, we formally developed a proposal 
We looked at other emeritus colleges. The, the first one was at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. But Yale University started one, University of Washington and others, to develop our ideas. And uh, under the leadership of uh, Dick Jacob, we hosted the national meetings in 2006 of uh, the emeritus colleges and other uh, retirement higher education associations. I thought uh, because we came as part of that development 50 years ago into a comprehensive research university, uh, we'd relate some of our experiences both uh, coming to ASU and then uh, form forming uh, our very active college. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, Professor Doan is the editor of our newsletter. Well, this is, the, it just came out. This is hot off the press. I, I hadn't even seen it. Uh, fully uh, until uh, she brought it here today. But we have a literary uh, journal that uh, comes out with uh, lots of interesting stories. We have a lectures and courses guide. Uh, we give lectures and courses all over the community. And uh, so there are lots of things going on, but I'm going to call on, on Professor Dick Jacob to relate some of these developments since he really formulated the initial idea and called those of us and, and five others. Professor Howard Voss is one of the founding uh, uh, founders of the college. He just walked in and I wanted, and uh, that, we got so excited about it, we really worked hard um, to put together a proposal. In fact, Professor uh, Voss and I were on the uh, bylaws committee and uh, that was interesting and uh, we, we have a set of bylaws, our constitution basically. Dick, let me call on you. Well, would you like me to comment a little bit about the history of the university before I get to the Emeritus College? Yes. I came here in 1963, which I think was quite a while before any of you showed up, so you're all new on the block. I know where the bodies are buried, you don't. Um, I came right out of graduate school, which these days would have been unthinkable. I had no postdoc experience, and I was the last person to be hired into uh, a research situation in our department, the physics department, without postdoctoral experience. I saw to that because um, my attitude and that of my colleagues, my joint at that time, was that everyone we hire has got to be better than anyone who is already here. We weren't always successful in that, but we were mostly successful in that, and we nowadays have a physics department which is very highly regarded around the country and is branched out into many areas that weren't even around uh, back then. Uh, when I arrived here, the size of the physics department faculty was about 12, more than half of whom were uh, actually involved in science education rather than physics. It was a leftover from the recent days then of uh, ASU being basically a teacher's college. And there was a great deal of that still remaining in the early 60s when I arrived. Of those 12, three were involved in research that could uh, lend itself to a PhD producing program. And the first PhD in physics was in fact awarded in 1964, uh, just after I got here. Uh, the university had about 12,000 students at the time. Uh, most of the uh, graduate students were graduate students in education. We did have a good number of uh, highly motivated graduate students in physics. Most of them were veterans of the Korean and the Vietnam conflicts. They were mostly married and mostly hungry. And they worked harder than, I'd have to say, any group of graduate students we've had since. And they were wonderful. Um, so I managed to crawl myself up through the ranks over the years, and after about 38 years, I decided that uh, I would bring home more money by retiring than I was making by not retiring, and so that seemed to be the tipping point, and I, I retired, but I didn't retire fully. I um, eased off with a couple of years at a 49% contract basis, continued to teach, but at the end of that two-year period, and I have to say, I was getting tired of, uh, of, of being obligated to people who were paying me a paycheck. 
And so I, I was not, uh, I, I wasn't sad about the fact that, that this was going to come to an end and, and, and my uh, uh, income was now going to come almost entirely from the uh, various pension programs I was enrolled in. But I still felt that I wanted to be involved in the world of physics and in the world of higher education and especially in a companionship with all of the friends and colleagues that I had met all along. And I realized that uh, at ASU, as at most universities, retired faculty were basically given a pat on the back, a gold watch. I actually did get an honest to goodness gold watch. It's got a sparky on it. A gold watch and uh, uh, a um, accompaniment to the door. Uh, this struck me as being wasteful of talent, and it struck me as being uh, unsympathetic to uh, the individuals involved, because no one really who has worked that long all their lives in something that they have devoted their entire being to, no one wants to be turned off of that like a light being turned off. I was reading the Chronicle of Higher Education one day, and I saw an article featuring an emeritus college at Emory University. Uh, I sat down and wrote an email to our brand new president, Michael Crow. I didn't expect him to read it, never mind reply to it, but reply to it he did. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was in conversations with our provost, Milt Glick. Uh, we had a couple of organizations on campus already that dealt with uh, emeriti, retired personnel, uh, but they weren't what was envisioned here. And, uh, but I met with some of the leaders of those organizations. Uh, we met again with the provost. A committee was formed. All of these individuals were on that committee, uh, along with half a dozen others. And we began doing the research necessary for writing a proposal to the university. The committee was formed in 2003. And we worked for about a year and submitted a proposal early in the summer of 2004. Our proposal was accepted by the administration without reservation. They bought it, the whole package. That's not to say that it has uh, materialized the whole, the whole package, but but the package in principle was agreed to. The Emeritus College was formed by a wave of magic wand. The committee members were turned into college council members. I was turned into a dean. And uh, we began from the middle of 2004 to the, way, uh, to the point that we are at today. And I think I've probably used up more time than I should, so I'm gonna let other people tell the story. Dick uh, really uh, did a great job and is a hard worker, and I, I'm going to uh, call on, uh, on Professors Elliott and Doan, but his, his story about getting a gold watch does tell you something about the academic nature of faculty service, because depending on the department you're in, and for example, how many research grants you get, depends on how much often you get paid. Now, physics, for example, and chemistry get National Science Foundation grants that are in the millions of dollars. Now, if you're in sociology, as I am, or in political science, six of us got National Science Foundation grants, including myself, but they're in the thousands of dollars. And then if you're in philosophy or English literature, you often don't get any large grants of that nature. So uh, Professor Jacob got a gold watch I got a Swiss Army watch, which is very good, by the way. I really uh, like it. And if you're in philo philosophy or English, I think you get a photo of a watch. But nevertheless, uh, they're, they're very much appreciated. But there is a difference in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the base of finances in the different areas. Well, Len, I didn't pull in millions of dollars on NSF grants either. <laughs> but you were in a department that did, though. And uh, well, I'm going to call on, uh, on Professor Chuck Elliott. Uh, I, I can't speak a lot about the past history of the university. I only came in 89. I had been at uh, three other places uh, prior to coming here. I, un, I did not come here to retire, although obviously I ultimately did. Um, I came at a time the engineering school was, was in, in the midst of a thing called the Engineering Excellence Program. 
we had a dean named Roland Hayden who was a very dynamic, uh, he, he'd fit the Crow mold, I, I'm inclined to think. Um, he left here to become provost at LSU and, and later was a senior academic officer at Texas A&M. But Roland, Roland had the idea that engineering schools had to be uh, closely connected to industry. We have a lot of good local industry. At the time, Motorola was the largest single employer in the valley. <clears throat> Unfortunately, today it's a shadow of its former self. But at the time, it was a big growing organization, as was Intel and several other companies. And Roland worked very closely with them to get them to make a good case with the university and with the legislature, which is ultimately where a lot of money comes from, uh, that we ought to have a first class engineering school here. And we needed their help to get that. So uh, that program was well underway. I, I came here uh, primarily as an administrator to do continuing education programs for engineering, because engineering as a professional school takes the uh, opinion that, that uh, it's a lifelong education. If you're gonna be a, a first-rate engineer, you gotta continue your education for a lifetime. A lot of students don't wanna hear that. A lot of students wanna graduate, now I'm done with it, I've got the hard part behind me. You're never done with it, particularly in engineering or science uh, profession. And so I, I just enjoyed being a part of that. I was also was very actively involved with the TV network. We uh, now use web-based more than anything now, with the similar to this program we're doing here. But at that time, we had a closed circuit television network all over the valley, primarily to major uh, industrial engineering uh, uh, locations where an engineer could take an hour off from work, catch a class, which also had a telephonic link so you could talk to a professor in class. Uh, and it was an excellent program, and I think it did a lot to create a vast number of master's degree program options that wouldn't have been available to students here. Uh, Engineering, I think, has, has had a pretty good record of, of, uh, of supporting research. Um, it, it has, its growth chart has been you know, phenomenal. Uh, but I, I'm also kind of proud to say, particularly in my department, industrial engineering, that we didn't let research totally drive out all the good teaching. Uh, we also had a focus to continue to do good teaching. And a lot of that had to do with the department chairman, of course, Phil Wolf at the time, who believed that you could do both, that they were not mutually exclusive activities. Uh, although doing first class research takes a lot of time. What a lot of people don't realize about research is, is one of the big reasons we do research uh, is not just to discover new knowledge, although that's obviously the key, but, but research supports graduate students. Most graduate students cannot afford these days to pay for their own education. And so you have to have research grants to help provide the kind of funding to pay for them. And uh, that gets lost, I think, in the shuffle sometimes of people saying, well, why do you spend all your time writing the research proposals and trying to get outside funding. It usually doesn't necessarily come back to your own pocket, but it does come back to the pockets of a lot of graduate students. I think that's an important thing. You know, that's a very good point, Chuck, if I can step in here for a second. I think a lot of people look at reports of professors maybe teaching one or two classes, and they see someone who then maybe has to work three or six hours a week. Well, ignoring for the time all uh, for the moment all the time spent in preparing and critiquing uh, performance in those classes someone who is guiding a graduate student will spend almost a full time 20 30 40 hours a week in the laboratory or in the office working with that student developing that student's abilities so that uh, he or she can go out into the world and be a productive scientist or, or teacher so uh, uh, handling a single graduate student in a PhD program is often much more equivalent in terms of effort than teaching an entire class. Can be, can be, no, no question about that. By the way, I just throw in, uh, not only do I agree with that, but I'm looking at one of my former doctoral students, Dave Williams, who's here, and uh, uh, he took a lot of time of work uh, to, and he did a great job, and he's a member of our Emeritus College. I'd just like to close my remarks with uh, a comment about the Emeritus College. I think it's a marvelous idea. I think it's a, a very much needed thing. I think it can do a lot of things for the university. I know one of the things that I've been involved in especially is, is I'm the senator for the college, the Academic Senate, which has now been just been reorganized so that there's one Academic Senate covering all four of the campuses. And Emeritus College was granted a voting membership in that, in that body. And I think it's very helpful for us to keep up with what's going on in the university through that. And hopefully, uh, I've joined the strategic planning committee that's looking into that area for the university. And I think hopefully we can bring some of the experience of emeritus professors who might just go off and be on their own and, and not have a, a lot to do with the university. They can come back and have some, uh, a place to have a, 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 some good positive input into the university and, and help serve us too. That's it. Thanks, Chuck. 
before I call on uh, Professor uh, uh, Winifred Doan, I just wanted to note as one of our uh, research professors, uh, she's an, ex uh, an exemplar of the kinds of things that happen over a career. Uh, in her research, for example, uh, and I believe your training was at the University of Wisconsin, was master's it? Master's degree. Yeah, pardon? Just yeah. my master's degree there. My PhD was Yale. At Yale, okay. Uh, well, that's almost as good as Wisconsin, so oh, that, that, yeah. I think that's good. <laughs> okay. The, uh, when uh, Winifred was doing research, one of the things that she discovered was something you couldn't get the full dimension of because I believe it's DNA research didn't develop until more recently, but it was, it's what is popularly, it was written up in the New York Times as the discoverer of the skinny gene. And I hope you'll mention that uh, in, uh, in your comments here because that was part of the great research that was going on uh, as we developed into a comprehensive uh, research uh, university. And as I mentioned, uh, Winifred Doan is one of our founding members and uh, great contributors. Uh, uh, when you have 366 members, uh, you get a lot of activity, but certain ones are key, and, and uh, Professor Doan is, is key. Winifred? Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, when I came here in 1977, it was a time when uh, ASU really looked like it had a lot of possibilities. There was enough money being given to the university by the state legislature to make it look very attractive. And um, I was ready to leave Connecticut because my husband was retiring from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station at the time. And he said to me, well, the last time it was my turn to take a job, now it's your turn. And he turned me loose. <laughs> and so I started looking around at the time, I was an associate professor at Yale, and um, I remember Dave Rasmussen in uh, the zoology department here heard about it, as did Chuck Wolf, and um, they sort of coaxed me to come out here and have a look. And my husband went off to an international entomology meeting in Hawaii and said, go ahead. So I came down here and I was very impressed. I, I could see there was much, much more to be done in terms of the building up of the support systems that are necessary to do really big time research here. But I, I thought this is some place I could maybe have a little influence. So I came here as a full, full professor and um, when I got here there was one biochemist on campus and uh, he was in the chemistry department. And I can remember the zoology department at the faculty meetings arguing whether they should ever hire a biochemist. Well, that is so passe now, it's unbelievable. We had one person in the department who was a molecular geneticist. And uh, the work I'd been doing at Yale was that the uh, interface between developmental biology and genetics, and it was just becoming known as developmental genetics, and um, moving into the molecular age, which developed after I got here really in terms of higher organisms, and the higher organism I worked on was the fruit fly. You may not think of it as a higher organism, but most of the things that are being done now of interest in genetics started out with fruit flies. And, uh, <laughs> and since Len mentioned it, I'll talk about my uh, fruit fly mutation that I discovered while I was at Yale. Actually, I did, it, I did my PhD there and um, did my thesis on this mutant. I named it adipose because the flies that were homozygous for this mutant uh, were just filled with lipid droplets in their so-called fat body, which is the insect equivalent of a liver. And um, they were deficient in carbohydrates. And it sort of looked to me like it was a model for uh, type 2 diabetes or obesity. And over the years, it was, a, it was too difficult. There were not the uh, techniques available to really study it until um, really the last 10 years before I retired, and especially the last year I retired, 
was uh, there was a molecular technique that was developed that really made it possible to do something with it. So the, the gene was sort of rediscovered by the outside world, and I had kept it going and had had master's students working on it, a couple of postdocs worked on it and so forth. But one of the things that they didn't have in my department when I came here were postdoctoral research people. And um, I was fairly well funded. In fact, within the first oh, five years of my being here, I was, <laughs> it was hard to believe, but up in, I was in the top 10 of the highest people bringing in income from uh, federal grants, NSF and NIH. And um, I look back now and see the kind of money that ASU brings in. I mean, that was peanuts compared to what they get now. But even so, it was, it, I was fairly well funded. So I always had a fairly good number of postdocs in my lab, at least two, sometimes three, as well as graduate students. And I had a lab about oh, 12 to 14 people with technicians as well. So we were pretty busy, but at the time, I wasn't working on adipose. I was working on um, a model system for studying gene regulation by studying the alpha amylase gene in fruit flies. And at that time, they were just beginning to uh, get some inklings about how genes were controlled in higher organisms, and that was one of the model systems that was being looked at, and I sort of pioneered in that area. But as time went on, uh, eventually I retired, and um, the year I retired was 1998, and the very next day, I took off for um, Germany because I had been invited over by someone who wanted my skinny gene, as it was called, the adipose mutant, because he wanted, he thought he was going to get himself a Nobel Prize with it, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> he, uh, he wanted my mutant and invited me over to um, a workshop so I could bring my mutant with me and talk to people. We set up a collaboration, and they indeed over there with me doing the genetic and cytogenetic studies here, we did clone the gene, and they sequenced it over there, and then it took off, and now it's become very, very important gene. It's opened up a whole new avenue of research in not just fruit flies, but the same gene is all the way up the evolutionary scale from uh, uh, worms to humans. And uh, so we have a new uh, approach now to be looking at obesity and possibly type 2 diabetes. I got involved with the Emeritus College um, by being on a, the steering committee that put together the uh, proposal that uh, Dick Jacob told you about. And um, I hesitated whether I should get on that, but I did. And um, I found it very interesting. While I was uh, in the uh, zoology department, which then became the biology department, I didn't have much time to meet people from other departments or other units on campus. And this was a wonderful opportunity. I met so many interesting new people, and I was really taken by it. So I was glad when um, the president approved our proposal as it was written. And one of the last things I put in, my, among the things we discussed, I said, well, we ought to maybe consider having a press, an emeritus college press. And Dick picked up on that. and. Uh, He's about a year later, after we were formed, and the college actually was established in 2005, in 2006, April, he put out the first issue of the newsletter. And he had, it's a quarterly newsletter, and uh, it started out to be about eight pages long, and then came around, uh, he put out three issues, and then he talked me into taking over as editor the following January and announced to me that it would now be 12 pages long. <laughs> so 
what to fill it with. Well, at first I didn't quite know what to do because uh, I wasn't sure how much to put in there. I had put together one big brochure for the um, ASU some time back. Um, I was instrumental in uh, putting together the molecular and cellular biology graduate program here. And when they needed somebody to put together a brochure with all the faculty and their photographs and descriptions and whatnot, I put that together for them. So I had a little understanding of how these things are done. Anyway, I took over and it's just amazing. This uh, Meredith College has grown so, and, pe and not just in numbers, but uh, in the types of activities that are going on that I'm running out of space. 12 pages is not enough any longer. <laughs> and so it's been quite a challenge to every third month put everything into the newsletter and get it sent out. And I'll turn it back to Lynn at that. Well, there, since uh, this is a focus on the history of Arizona State University, I uh, wanted to relate that, uh, that uh, Winifred Doan's department created some serious problems for me because for 11 years, I was associate dean for, uh, 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 of academic programs for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, which is the academic dean within the college. And we were creating our honors program, which is now the honors college. I was working with Professor uh, Ted Humphrey, who had been chair of the philosophy department, became dean of the college. And uh, we were attracting some of the best students not only in the state, but in the country. Uh, in fact, uh, we're at the point now where we have more national merit scholar students than any university in the country with the exception of Harvard. So we're, we're, but the problem was, one of my jobs was to go out and talk to the parents and upper one, two, three, four, and five percent students that graduating from high school. And I had a great line when I was introduced. I'd say, I'm in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, that's the A through Z college, anthropology through zoology. And Professor Doan was in the Department of Zoology. And then, in about my third year of my 11 years, Professor Jim Collins, the chair of the zoology department, said, you know, we want to change our name to biology because it's a more comprehensive term than zoology. And my first reaction was, that's going to kill my best line when I'm trying to attract all these <laughs> upper 1% and 2% students. But it was a good proposal, and we did it, and we still attracted the students. But it did create a problem for me. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd mention that. Well, are there other thoughts, Dick, that I, you I'd have like as founding to, dean? Well, I'd like to um, relate the two things we're talking about, the university and the Emeritus College, in terms of teaching. Uh, Chuck mentioned teaching. And I think teaching is something the value of which all of us have, have, have held throughout our entire careers. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, in my home department, the physics department, teaching along with research has always been an essential for someone's success. And uh, uh, all of the faculty taught, and most of the faculty taught throughout the curriculum, all the way from introductory uh, general studies courses uh, to uh, the most complex graduate courses. We would spend a few years in one and then go on to another, and we rotated people through that. Uh, I was chair of physics for a few years, and, and uh, uh, this is one thing that we always tried to accomplish, was to make sure that all of our students at any level had contact with our outstanding faculty so that they could see how much uh, vibrance and, and interest a uh, a solid researcher could bring to the classroom. Now, teaching is something that all of us have, well, we came into academia because we knew we had a, a basic visceral love for teaching. And that has continued. Uh, that's, uh, that's been a constant for all of us. And in the Emeritus College, we have opportunity to continue with that. But for me, it's been a different style. Now. I have, on occasion, gone back and offered a class in the physics department as they've needed, and that's always fun to do, and I expect I might do that again in the future. But the kind of teaching that uh, I have been doing uh, recently uh, has been teaching out in the community uh, through the auspices of various organizations, uh, 
uh, ASU, the Osher Foundation, uh, the uh, Tempe Connections, and others. Uh, single lectures or, in fact, short courses. Uh, these are lectures and courses primarily to the 50-something group in our community. Uh, most of my students are retired. Uh, some of them are retired from technical areas, but most of them are not. And so we, I offer a course that's comparable to a freshman level general studies course. It's not a course in physics, it's a course about physics, but, but I enjoy teaching it. I enjoy the commitment of the students, the engagement of the students. It's uh, teaching to groups like this is an entirely different experience than teaching regularly on campus. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to, um, uh, to experience this new type of uh, activity in, in something that basically I really enjoy doing. Uh, and several other members of the Emeritus College do this. The booklet that uh, Len held up earlier is the list of individuals who do this and the courses and the lectures that they make available. And these are available to anyone in the, any organization in the community who wants to call on us. Dick is raising a really important issue about the nature of Arizona State University, which is somewhat different than the older established uh, universities, uh, comprehensive research universities, Research One, that have been around doing that for one, two, or more centuries. And that's, we were coming into a new environment and a growing environment, and we had a commitment to a tradition here of strong undergraduate education. Now, if, uh, to give you an example, I have three children. One graduated here at Arizona State University, my oldest daughter, Melinda Sue. My youngest daughter uh, graduated Pomona, which is a, a great undergraduate college in California. And my son graduated Stanford. I'd say my two daughters got a better education because they had great teaching at the undergraduate level. My son didn't get the great professors at Stanford until he was a senior and a graduate student. They got graduate students, and the faculty were working on these large grants. Well, we, we were pushed to get our research grants, and, and, and we did. But because of the tradition here from the inception, in, as in physics and sociology and English and other departments, research faculty were assigned to teach undergraduates. And so faculty uh, really here who are research faculty would do more teaching at the undergraduate level than you would have expected or seen. For example, at Michigan or Stanford or uh, Berkeley or uh, Yale and other places. Of course, uh, Winifred, you were at Yale at, at graduate school, so you got the great faculty. But, but that really is an important point. It's part of the tradition here, and you can see it in the emeriti faculty who give lectures teach uh, off-campus and on-campus courses uh, as well. Chuck, would you like to make any observations? Just make a comment about uh, retirement in general. Um, if you're lucky, everybody gets to retire, uh, if you want to. Uh, as you know, in general, most category, uh, you can't be forced to retire anymore. But, but I think it's really critical to point out that you need something to retire to, uh, not just retire from. And I think it's, it's really helpful that the university has this structure now with the Emeritus College that gives excellent place for people to retire to if they want to. Uh, I have one uh, yeah. plug I've got to put in for the women. <laughs> when I first came here, I was the second woman, woman in the um, zoology department. And there were not many, very many women on campus at the time on the faculty, regular faculty, that is. Um, but at any rate, uh, two years before, I had, I had been in the early days of, in the formation of the Association for Women in Science <clears throat> when I was at Yale. And uh, when I came here, there was no chapter on this campus or anywhere nearby, although they did have a chapter down at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And I was so busy, I didn't give it much thought. I sent in my dues every year and that sort of thing. But beyond that, I wasn't very active. Then two years before I retired, I had a call from the uh, national office. And they thought that ASU probably should have its own chapter 
of AWIS, as it's called, the Association for Women in Science. And uh, by the way, Jim Collins is a member of it. it we do take men <laughs> as well, because it's for women, not of women. And uh, anyway, I got together women in the area, and we did form a chapter that was officially installed in 1997, the year before I retired. And it was pretty active at first, but then um, later on it sort of, sort of slumped off, but it's now been reformed again. And just last spring, um, the, our current president in the national office came out to ASU. She was serving as an outside reviewer for a thesis in the Honors College here. And she was so impressed by the chapter we have here that they decided to have the national meeting here. And it's going on right now. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to meet all the board members and officers from the national office over at Jane Meinshine's house. <laughs> we have a, a lot of, uh, in fact, that raises the issue of our outreach. We've had outreach in our, co we, we are, giving courses and lectures all over the community uh, in Mesa, in Phoenix, in Scottsdale, everywhere. And the part of that, for example, is we've been uh, working with the Teach for America program at ASU and making connections for presentations for very bright students to teach for two years in low-income schools uh, at a minimum. And uh, that's gone from 18 to 42 in the last year, and it's, gonna, it's growing more this year. We have members in our bylaws that can join from other accredited universities. So the, the chair, uh, the director of our press is Don Sharps, who's from Weber State University. And uh, I uh, play softball. I used to play in the Detroit League um, Tuesday and Friday mornings. And the new shortstop came in from Cambridge. And he retired from the Harvard School of Medicine, Eric Van Sonnenberg. He's now one of our most active uh, members. And uh, when he asked me, did the council, including the people on this, accept him as a member of the Arizona State University Emeritus College. I said, I told them you were from a very good up and coming school near Boston, and they uh, said that was fine. So he's a member, uh, we have 15 members from other universities of our 366 members. So while it's overwhelmingly uh, ASU Emeriti faculty, w that part of it is growing as well. Oh, I, I, we have just one more comment by our founding <coughs> dean. I'd like to say that the Emeritus College is the application of an ideal. It's an ideal with practical ramifications. I think the ideal is, is succinctly expressed in, in a slogan we have, a place and a purpose, and a mantra, you can't retire from what you are. And with both of these in mind, we've expanded into all the directions we have, both for the edification of the community for service to the university, and for our own personal growth and development. Uh, it's been a marvelous thing to come about in the lives of all of us, uh, that we have attracted so many of the existing ASU Emeriti into our membership ranks, as well as several others from other universities, I think speaks to the potential that uh, is obvious to all of us when we look at it. I hope you get a sense of what a great uh, experience it is to be with a, a group of great colleagues, some of whom I wouldn't have interacted with if it wasn't for the Emeritus College. I think many of us feel that way, and it helps us to do what we do and, and to reach out. It's been great talking about our being part of Arizona State University. <laughs>